is time racist? I mean, I, I only ask because there's this one phrase that we often encounter when seeking racial justice. Change takes time. Is that how it works? I mean, we're usually told to take action to make things happen. But for racism, change takes time. Is time in control? Was racism inevitable? Or was it caused by deliberate actions? Was segregation inevitable? Time made it happen? Or did people make racist maps to control our access through society? Was the colonization of Africa and the mass enslavement of its people inevitable? Time made that happen. Or did countries and corporations create maps to carve up Africa and chart courses across oceans to conquer, to kidnap, and to sell human beings? Is time racist? Did time commit those horrors? Is time now delaying justice? As a National Geographic explorer, I navigate intersections of racial justice and geography, and I don't think time is racist. But maps, on the other hand, maps have been racist, and maps can be racist. We use maps to handle complex and common challenges every day, from climate change to broadband access to pothole management. But maps that don't see race put communities of color at risk. And maps of vulnerable populations often leave black people vulnerable to racism. And this has to change. The reality is, race and maps, this is not terra incognita. In the past, map makers acted boldly to use maps to help establish racism. So today, people who use and make maps have to be as bold to use all the technology we have available to help eliminate racism. And I've worked with organizations in many different sectors, working to use maps to improve their, their services for the public and for consumers. And they're combining maps and policy every day to impact all of our lives. And what kind of work are we talking about? We're talking about urban planning, public health, engineering, permit inspections, you name it. And who's in those jobs? People just like us, who live in a society that makes it seem as if conversations about race and racism are off limits. I mean, if we admit it, if we admit it to ourselves, we all know someone who's uncomfortable saying phrases like black people or white people. So how can you have a constructive conversation about eliminating the challenges of the disparities between those communities? So for the safety, the health, and prosperity of every community, if your organization has an impact on people, then you have to grow comfortable talking about race and racial equity in the context of your work. But why maps? Maps and geography are powerful tools. If you don't know how to, if you don't know how to get somewhere, maps help you find the way. When you encounter a new space, geography helps you describe the environment. There's a hill, there's a valley, there's a neighborhood, there's a population. City planners use maps and geography to design the future of our public spaces. And during disasters, federal agencies use maps and geography to navigate and respond to our needs. But oftentimes, these tools have been used in ways that harm. Going back to the 1400s, the Portuguese began mapping Africa to kidnap their people and forced them to serve in Europe and later in the Americas. And by the 1500s, the triangular trade of enslaved people was well mapped and well established. And over the course of 350 years, 12 and a half million people were violently removed from their communities, forcibly subjected to slavery, and compressed into a singular colonial identity that we call black. That's 12 and a half million people, more than the population of Portugal, one of many European countries that were once global leaders in the trade of enslaved people, reaping great wealth at the cost of human lives. And many Americans visit Europe to explore their rich culture and to connect with their own roots. So do I. As a descendant of Africans disconnected from my roots through that middle passage, I visit Europe to work with and learn from organizations that are preserving and sharing the histories of black people. I was recently in Holland, and I met with leaders of the Ojise Network. These are messengers sharing educational resources to help organizations better serve the black diaspora. 
They took me to the one and only monument in Rotterdam, commemorating the ending of Dutch slavery. While we were there, they reminded me that the Dutch were great shipbuilders, efficient at storing cargo, and excellent at outmaneuvering their competitors in the triangular trade of people. I also met with leaders of NINSE, the National Institute for the Study of Dutch Slavery and its Legacy. And they talked about an event that happened last year in 2023, where some of their founders were with the Dutch king, and the king apologized for the Dutch involvement in slavery and its lingering impacts. You see, the Dutch sought to monopolize the triangular trade of people. They didn't say change takes time. They created maps to chart oceans, to kidnap, store, and ship over half a million people as property. When I was in Germany, I wanted to know more about the conference in Berlin from 1884. And at this conference, leaders from Europe and the United States sat around a map of Africa, designing ways to divide that community, its people, and all of its resources. From the 1400s through the 1800s and beyond, colonizers wanted to funnel the value of Africa into their empires, and they did not say change takes time. They used maps to plot their actions. Now, bringing things closer to home, all of my grandparents and most of their siblings were born in the 1920s in Jim Crow segregated South Carolina. They lived the Great Migration. When families like mine moved away from the South, uh, away from racial terror in the South and towards opportunity elsewhere. And my grandparents never really talked too much about that time. So when my grandmother was literally on her deathbed, I leaned over and I asked my uncle, her brother, to share some of his experiences from the Great Migration. And the first thing he said was, what's the Great Migration? Like I said, they had lived it. They weren't looking back and studying it. And eventually he told me about common moments of joy interrupted by common acts of violence. I mean, his face lit up when he talked about the sweet tasting well water that pumped right outside their mother's house that was so cold in the summertime that it could crack glass. And he talked almost too casually about racist attacks on black families by white mobs. That was his answer to why they left. And where'd they go? Well, in 1934, the government spread redlining practices across the country. In over 200 cities, these federally directed policies used, used racist maps to support and bolster segregation. And this was happening in many of the cities that black people were, were going to to flee Jim Crow segregation and to find opportunity. That's what happened to my grandparents. They moved to Philadelphia in 1950. My mother was born in 1951. And they lived in a red line community. I myself spent my early childhood in that same community with its limited resources, outdated textbooks, a library that was more than a mile away on foot, often closed, and police vehicles and taxi cabs seemed to have the same aversion to showing up when we called. And when this neighborhood was redlined in 1938, only white people were allowed to get mortgages to buy property. And when I was living there, not much had changed. You see, the government recognized the value, economically and socially, of home ownership. They placed a high value on, white, on, on native whites, but they viewed black people as detrimental influences, as infiltrators. And they didn't say change takes time. They saw the migration happening. They used maps to plot their actions. Today, during disasters, maps and geography help us to allocate much needed resources, mitigate risks, and prepare our, future, our communities for future challenges. But what about Hurricane Katrina? I remember watching the news intently, and I remember someone said something offhanded and in shock themselves, like, we know exactly how many people are going to die, and we know where. From my experience in public service, I knew that was going to be true, because they would use digital maps and spatial data about communities. From my experience as a black American, I suspected that black people would bear greater burdens. As it turned out, 51% of people killed by the hurricane in Louisiana were black, even though black people made up only 33% of the state. And what about COVID-19? We all watched medical and government websites looking at maps and charts of the spread and impact of COVID-19, but unfortunately, most of them were colorblind. They were designed without regard to race or racism, but we were lucky. 
there were some people, largely black and brown women across the country, using maps and spatial data to explore racial disparities. And they helped us to see that if you were black, you could be between two and six times more likely to die. In DC, 72% of the deaths were of black people, even though black people only made up 45% of the population. What if we had mapped racial disparities earlier in the crises? What about the next crises? Can we afford to say change takes time when black and brown communities are up against the clock? And I've also seen how hard black people work in every industry, especially in mapping, to earn a seat at the table, only to be ignored or forgotten. And I could tell lots of people's stories, but I'll, I'll share one of mine. Once I was on an IT leadership team that was asked to create programming to help get black and Latino boys from the poorest neighborhoods involved in technology. And at our very first meeting, someone interrupted the conversation to say, but where do we even find these people? Well, I was once one of those kids. I grew up in a low-income, predominantly black neighborhood, and because I bumped into mapping technology at work, my life was transformed. So I shared some practical ideas about using maps to explore communities, partnering with other organizations already involved on the ground, and bringing black and Latino IT staff on board as mentors. And wouldn't you know it, I was soon uninvited from future meetings. I had to watch from the sidelines as those efforts floundered for years. And because of all those experiences and experiences that others have shared with me, I started a nonprofit called the North Star of GIS. And GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems. Probably one third of you have used it or know what it is, but it's basically dig digital mapping. And I work together with people across the country and across the globe, really, to grow a melanated and mapping community of black mapping students, educators, entrepreneurs, and professionals. And we promote mapping practices rooted in racial justice, and we highlight the work of our melanated and mapping community around the globe. We don't say change takes time. We recognize the power of maps to shift our future. And people will always say change takes time. I disagree. Change takes action. They'll also say, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon or a relay race. Well, either way, it's a race. And we're competing against racism, sexism, and other systems of oppression working together to defeat us. And what if it is a relay race? Shouldn't we run our part of it as if we may be the last to hold the baton? We have to win. So if you're using maps and you recognize that maps can be racist, understand that they can also advance racial justice. So when you make maps, when you use them, make sure that black people are involved in creating the data and the maps, as well as other people marginalized by racism. When you create maps and policy, ensure that they're designed to advance racial justice from the, be from the beginning, not as an afterthought, not as a next step. And if we can all do that over and again, we can collectively bend the arc of the moral universe toward justice. Thank you in advance and happy pride.